All right, Bitcoin. We have um, a panel on uh, the future of Bitcoin. Before that, we'll have a look at a uh, short video. Uh, this video has been produced by a uh, uh, designer, Duncan Elms, uh, who is uh, uh, in uh, New York City. And it's uh, written by an Australian journalist, Mark Fennell. And uh, uh, we already had it in uh, uh, Low Web London. And I find it very good to explain what Bitcoin is. So let's have a look at, um, at this video. The world is in financial disarray. Currencies failing, economies in wild flux, jobs being lost. But what if you could build an entirely new economy, one specifically designed for the digital realm? Well, that is the dream behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a decentralised electronic cash system that uses peer-to-peer -peer networking along with digital signatures and crypto graphics to generate currency. Now, with traditional money, think dollars, the euro, pesos, you've got a central bank, like the Federal Reserve. They issue the currency and they print more or less cash as needed, but not with Bitcoin. Bitcoins are generated using a process called mining. Your computer is given a complex mathematical problem to solve, and the goal is a 64-digit number. If your grey box can successfully solve that algorithm, then congratulations, you are the proud owner of a new block of 50 Bitcoins. The network automatically adjusts the difficulty of mining so that 50 bitcoins are created roughly every 10 minutes. The reason they call it mining is because there's a set number of bitcoins that can ever be mined in the system. There's only 21 million bitcoins that will ever be created in total. You can't just print off cash like they do in the real world. You're digging it out of the system like precious metals from some mathematical mine. Right now, a Bitcoin is roughly worth 70 US dollars. Last year, miners generated the equivalent of $16.7 million worth of Bitcoins, and we're only halfway down the mine shaft with over 10 million Bitcoins unearthed already. Like any economy, you don't want too much too fast because then the value of your currency drops, or so slow that your economy grounds to a halt. It's designed to be a self-stabilising economy. Whether it actually is that way, though, well, that is a little bit more complicated. Welcome to the exchanges. These exchanges allow people to buy and sell bitcoins with each other. The largest bitcoin exchange is Mt. Gox. And it's here that you can purchase bitcoins using local currencies. You can even store bitcoins too. Mind you, that can be a bit risky. Hackers have, on occasion, dangerously destabilised these exchanges. Bitcoin is also the currency that fuels what's known as the dark web. Using software called Tor, you can hide your identity online and access the digital marketplace they call the Silk Road, where sellers flog illegal drugs like LSD, heroin and marijuana. Buyers conduct all transactions using Bitcoin. The influence of Bitcoin is growing. WikiLeaks and WordPress will accept Bitcoin as cash. Even the ideas behind Bitcoin are already changing the way people think about cash. The Royal Canadian Mint have just launched Mintchip, an electronic currency backed by the Canadian government that borrows a lot from the philosophy of Bitcoin. And ultimately, that is what's most powerful about Bitcoin. Not the coins itself, but the way it can change the way we look at, think about, and most importantly, spend our money. It's amazing how uh, this video is already, uh, which is amazing, but uh, $70 a Bitcoin, it went up to $1,000 just uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, Silk Road has been shut down. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, let me welcome the panel, James Currier, who is the uh, co-founder of Uga Labs and curator of a great conference called NFX. He's going to talk as well tomorrow. Gary Hillman, who is the... Uh, uh, an economic historian at the London School of Economics. And we have Shakil Khan, that uh, doesn't need much introduction. He was the head of special product projects at Spotify, and he's the founder of Coindesk, which is a news site dedicated to Bitcoin. Please join me on stage. Welcome, Thank you. Shaq. Welcome back. Thank you. 
Thank you. So uh, this is, this is going to be a uh, really rapid 40 minutes. We're going to get in and through Bitcoin in that amount of time. My name is James Courier. Um, I'm the founder of three successful venture-backed companies in Silicon Valley, uh, now running a conference called NFX around network effects. And nothing is more network effecty than currencies. We're going to talk about that today. Um, I'm also up here. Uh, Loic asked me to come in. I was on the board of Second Life for about five years. And we, had a, we have a currency called Linden Dollars, which grew to $750 million in GDP. And we were talking at the board level about five years ago about spinning it out as a global currency. We never did. Also started a gaming company that grew to $65 million in US dollars, but that was a virtual currency that people could spend in the game. I also own, own Bitcoin, so I need to make that disclosure. Um, so today we've got um, uh, Garrick Heilman with us. And Garrick is uh, an economic historian at the London School of Economics. He's also the founder of Macro Digest, which is sort of like Bloomberg for uh, economics. It aggregates interesting stories about economics. And he's a contributing writer to Coindesk. And Coindesk was founded by Shaquille Khan, who's also with us. Um, Shaquille's the head of special projects at Spotify, and he's one of the earliest investors there. Um, he's also an investor and the mentor to Nick, who you just met at Sumley. Um, he's now the founder of Coindesk, which is the Bloomberg for everything related to math-based currencies. So rather than have a conversation between the three of us and just sort of bang through some of the basics, you've just seen a video, but let us um, see if we can't get up to speed. Uh, so, in the olden days, 3,000 years ago, people were trying to exchange value, and they would use gold and silver. Notice something, that you can use this currency both for the storage of value, as well as the exchange of value, and those things are different, we're going to talk about that today, uh, and how it plays out in the digital currencies we have. Then after a while, people said, wow, we have these printing presses, let's create some paper-based currency, and we can print it out. What's interesting about printing, and the US is a good example, prior to 1863, there were literally 8,000 private entities that were printing their own money. This was a patchwork of exchange between various regions in the United States. The problem with it was counterfeiting was relatively easy, and it was just unwieldy to move 10 miles and have to use a different currency. So in 1863 in the US, for instance, uh, they signed the Federal Currency Act, which created a fiat currency for the first time in the United States. All the other countries followed suit. In 1971, the United States came off the gold standard. Now remember, the gold standard was invented only in 1821 by Britain. The United States only got onto the gold standard in 1873. So in less than 100 years, the US got on the gold standard and got off the gold standard. This is not something that's been around for 3,000 years. So then we come to digital currencies. What was the first digital currency? Arguably, it was frequent flyer miles from United, 1972. The next one we saw was in, and then we saw all the airlines do it. The next one we saw was in 1995 with Cybergold, 96 came eGold, 99 came Beans. These were all centralized currencies with one place where the, the currencies would exchange. They never got off the ground for various reasons. 2002, here comes QQ, right, with QCoins. What was different about this, that the belief in QCoins was so great, people started using their currency outside of QQ.com, which led the Chinese government in 2007 to issue laws banning that sort of use. Also in 2002 comes Linden Lab with the Linden dollar. What was different about this currency was that for the first time you could trade it externally to the environment through exchanges, just like you could trade uh, a British pounds or you could trade whatever uh, fiat currency you might want. 2007, we had Ace Bucks. Don't forget Ace Bucks. It was a startup that was trying to do sort of credits on Facebook, backed by Peter Thiel. Didn't work. Uh, a few years later, Facebook said, let us try it. And they tried credits, tried that for three years. What was interesting about this is they had such massive um, outreach, and they could force people to use it. Also didn't work. 
Same year, 2009, along comes Bitcoin. It's the first distributed cryptocurrency. Okay, so what's different about this? Boom, it's open source. The software is readable, usable, replicable. Anyone can play with it. Secondly, it's distributed. There is no central arbiter of the exchange. This is the first time this was done. Next, they figured out a clever way of getting people to maintain the electricity and the computing power to maintain a distributed network by rewarding people with currency for doing those transactions. That's the mining that you just heard about. Third, no one owns it. Right? Everybody, all the other currencies to date have been owned by somebody. In this case, the founders figured out how to disappear. So it's just out there, it's part of the world. Number six, it's a protocol. Okay, you can read it, you can write on it, you can make programmable money. And also what's interesting, especially for someone interested in network effects, is there's been this incredible groundswell about Bitcoin. Okay? This is hard to do, it's hard to create. Another thing that's happening is you're getting a lot of companies jumping in to create brand new companies to support Bitcoin, to exchange Bitcoin, to use Bitcoin. Uh, this is a chart of the number of companies that have applied to BitAngels, 120, per, 120 angel group in the United States funding Bitcoin related companies. It's growing like crazy. And of course, you've got nine or, or more venture backed companies in this space, um, many of which we can now trust and, and uh, work with. And the last thing that's so interesting about Bitcoin, which was different, is the anonymity. And this has been the feature that has gotten the most press because it's led to a lot of shenanigans online. Uh, but all three of these big marketplaces for drugs and guns and whatnot are now shut down uh, as of a few weeks ago. So that's a big difference that's occurred in the last six months. What are some of the events? We're almost done. We're almost through this. We're going to get to the panel. On May 2013, the Chinese national television broadcast a series of programs about Bitcoin that appeared to give tacit government approval to use Bitcoins to the, to the Chinese. In November 12, 2013, Ben Bernanke from the Federal Reserve comes out and said, this looks pretty interesting. It's not something that we're in the business of regulating. That's a big deal. However, December 5th, just a few days ago, the uh, PBC, the People's Bank of China, comes out and says no financial institution can use bitcoins. Nobody can touch them from a financial perspective. But the Chinese people are allowed to use them as they want, but they're saying it's extremely risky. We don't encourage it. Subsequently, any company that's a larger public company in China that had been playing with taking bitcoins has retracted that ability. So what is a bitcoin worth? It was worth 70 bucks in July. Bitcoin China took off in October and the price started up. Bernanke makes his comments. The value of it explodes. It hits 1200 and then the People's Bank of China makes their announcement and it drops down to 550. It's back up to 930 as we speak. Very volatile. How many Bitcoins are there? There are now 12 million on our way to 21. Should get there by about 2040. How much is it worth? It's about 12 billion market cap for all the Bitcoins. If you look at the about a $900, $880 price, compare that to gold, which is at 7 trillion, 630 times the amount. Where can you spend it? You can spend it all over the world, but in not that many places, only about 1,000 places. Who's getting rich? That's always interesting. Well, it turns out there's about 99 wallets with over 8.8 .8 million US dollars. Who's trading it? Up until a few weeks ago, it was 65% trading in China. That used to be the case. We'll see where it goes. And the last thing to mention, Bitcoin is not alone. The open source, open source software has been taken by other folks, and there's now over 60 cryptocurrencies using variations and various brandings of this sort of thing. And you can go to coinmarketcap.com to look at many of them. And one thing to think about is that if you look at the market cap of Bitcoin, it's about 10 times number two, which is Litecoin. And Litecoin is about 10 times number three, which is Peercoin. That's approximate, just a way of thinking about it. OK, so that's the end of the rush through to get us all on the same page around Bitcoin. So back to our panelists. Gentlemen. Um, 
why? Why are we talking about this? Loic has mentioned Bitcoin in probably half the panel so far today, and now we've got this big panel. Where's the excitement coming from? Why, why in particular the tech community? Why in particular developing countries? Well, when you think about uh, who's excited about Bitcoin, I like to think about different categories or groups. Uh, the technology folks are, of course, really excited about uh, the really innovative crypto uh, cryptography and protocol that's being developed. There's exotic hardware, application-specific uh, integrated circuits, which Shame showed you a picture of. On the flip side, you have governments, which are also very excited about Bitcoin. Uh, and I think of the Chinese symbol uh, for crisis, both opportunity and, and danger. Uh, on the danger side, regulation uh, concerns about uh, money laundering, tax evasion. But on the opportunity side, uh, governments are really interested in the kind of ep economic growth prospects for, for Bitcoin, the, the ability to attract uh, new investment, new ventures. Switzerland, for example, just recently uh, is talking about actually making Bitcoin an official currency um, because they see economic opportunity there in that country. So, um, and of course, venture capitalists and investors are very excited in Bitcoin because they're looking at a multi-trillion dollar payments industry uh, and seeing Bitcoin as, uh, as a possible candidate to disrupt that. Hmm. And what are some of the use cases? So make this tangible for us. What, what are we going to see us doing with this thing? Um, and where are we going to see it? So one of the things which I continuously um, talk about, and the more I spend time looking at it, the more obvious it becomes is the Western Union remittance model. Mm. You know, you've got somebody in London or Sweden or New York trying to send some money to somebody in Philippines or Africa. I'm guessing if they want to send $100 I think the fee may be around $20 or 20% of that. This is the people with very little money trying to make you know, ends meet with their family members. Why is that taking place, right? Why is that taking place? So I think if you look at overall the financial systems that are ripe for disruption, but there are some specifics, especially I think remittance is one. I think overseas trading, me wanting to buy something from a US-based website, you know, which happens now every day the credit card transaction fees are being hit, the, the merchant or, or the business they're being hit would say 3% or whatever their credit card processing fee is, but I am on top of that, I'm paying say $99, the exchange rate that I'm being hit. So you know, these are just two very easy ones and Gary can obviously explain far more detail, but you see that just those two alone account for billions and billions of dollars of movement in the financial system. Right. Carrick, any others? Well, if you think about a country like Argentina or, or any country that's going through or has gone through a financial <laughs> crisis, I mean, you see the volatility in the price of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin uh, is not alone in terms of currency volatility. And so you could see people wanting to move out of, say, a domestic uh, national currency and into something like Bitcoin as a safe store value. I mean, one of the, the big events for Bitcoin in 2013 was the uh, crisis in Cyprus when there was this tax announced on depositors, and we saw the price of Bitcoin really shoot up in, in, in response to this, and people realizing, well, wait a minute, uh, we, we don't just have to sit here and, and, and get liquidated, watch our euros get taxed away, we can actually maybe move into something like Bitcoin as a, a, a store of safe value. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to recognize that there's a kind of future for Bitcoin um, that's different from today, where today Bitcoin is very much primarily a financial asset, as Jane mentioned, James mentioned, uh, there aren't that many places where you can use it for uh, merchant transactions, and, um, um, but in the future, we certainly could see that. So you're saying today it's uh, much more of a store of value, sort of like an alternative to gold, and it's not mm -hmm. so much of a transaction currency yet. It could be, but it's, it's not as much yet in exactly. its history of growth. Um, you I know, think one we need um, some more mainstream adoption, you know, whether it's Amazon or whether it's... Mm -hmm. you know, it's probably going to come from one of the online retailers, I think, as a starting point. You know, if we look at where we are now, WordPress is starting to accept it. I think OkCupid, or, but there are a number of companies who have started embracing it, but until a household name does start accepting it, and they've got to find the relevant reasons why, and I think legislation on their part comes into it, because it'll probably be getting encouraged by the technical department who understand it, but you're a CFO of a publicly listed company do you want that risk? And right. even to the extent you don't necessarily understand it as much 
that you would like to, so the easy option is, hey, we're not ready for this. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, we were talking to uh, Silicon Valley Bank the other day, and they were saying that they're just trying to help their, their customers figure out how to deal with Bitcoin once they get it in the company. How does it touch the rest of the financial system? The rules aren't clear. No one knows, you know, what their liability is. And so people are waiting yeah. right now. So, you know, you could, some of these things for consumers to adopt them and for these companies to adopt them, for the, the board of Amazon or the board of PayPal to say, yeah, let's do this, it needs to be tangible for people. And people need to be able to feel it and trust it. How are we going to get there? What, what can you see over the next year that will happen that would help us get there? So, you know, in regards to the feeling and the touching, I'm going to go slightly off tangent here. I heard this in 2006 when Daniel Ek at Spotify was a 22-year-old entrepreneur, said, I'm going to try and change the world. And the meetings we'd have is, and so many meetings would go into, people go, well, you don't understand, guys. I need to feel the CDs, right? I need my cover art. I have a bespoke bookshelf, a CD rack made for them, and that's where it is. And that was the argument then. Move forward a few years, you know, another two years, conversation moved on to, well, you know, I need to own the file. I need to own the file on my laptop, and what you're proposing is a virtual thing. And I know the two are very different, yeah. but just the mindset changes very, very quickly. When was the last time somebody, when they were watching a Netflix movie to you, said, hey, you know what, what I really miss is those 600 DVDs cluttering up this cabinet. It doesn't happen anymore, right? So that is moving. Yes, money is very, very different. but. You're walking around with your credit card. You're walking around with, ultimately, apps on your phone. I think Starbucks accounts for X amount of transactions, a significant percentage now being done on their mobile. That is money. That's not, you know, you're not feeling that. It's a virtual app or virtual system taking place. You walk into Starbucks, people quite easily pull out their phone, scan it, and pay for a coffee. Bitcoin is not much different than that. Got it. Got it. And. What are some of these things? Like, for instance, um, if we had a, uh, a big bracket bank start to do research on, uh, you know, Bitcoin this year and start publishing, would that make it easier for the financial? I, I think industry? we've already seen that Bank of America Merrill Lynch mm -hmm. just um, published a report about a week ago. And, you know, let's face it, whether they come out publicly admit it, every large corporation and every financial institution is looking into Bitcoin. I see it from the number of inquiries we get, one from institutions in the finance space, and whether that's the large consumer ones or whether it's hedge funds or private equity funds, because it's very significant to any finance um, industry. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have that, and then two, you know, from the actual retailers, whether it's Walmart or Target or, you know, UK high street chains, everyone's very realistically looking at this. So the reports are relevant. The key is who's writing the reports. I mean, the only thing I would say is Coindesk, for me, was a way of myself getting information. There wasn't anywhere I could go and get information. And I said, well, maybe I should launch something. And seven or eight months later, we're one of the largest sources of Bitcoin information in the world. And I will put my hand up and say, I am just slightly less ignorant than everyone else about it because it's, it's changing so fast. Yeah. So an analyst who just got into it two weeks ago and issues a report thinks actually misleading their customers because there's a lot more to it than just somebody spending a few hours on the web and going, hey, here's my financial analysis on the topic. I'd be keen to hear from our esteemed economic <laughs> historian on the topic. Mm. Well, my, my first career actually was in an investment bank, so it was quite interesting to see uh, not just Bank of America, but another uh, bank down in uh, Los Angeles, Wed Bush, Bush also uh, initiate uh, the first, I think, broker-dealer valuation model for Bitcoin. And they looked at Bitcoin as um, you know, a possible disruptor to payments and a store of value and, and uh, came up with a price target or price range based on adoption rates and timeframes of anywhere between $10,000 and $100,000 for Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, the Wall Street is starting to pay attention to Bitcoin, I think is the, the bottom line. And, um, you know, if some of these ecosystem companies take off, which uh, VCs are backing and want to go public, 
that's going to be a whole other reason for, uh, for Wall Street to get interested in Bitcoin. Are there some shocks to the system that could take place that would bring Bitcoin to the spotlight of the world, like another Cyprus or... Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, we're here in France. I don't have to tell uh, the, the folks inside the European Union that the uh, European sovereign debt crisis is, is not completely resolved. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about what's going to happen next, when the next shoe's going to drop. Uh, countries like Greece uh, certainly still have a very large high level of debt, um, and, and we don't know what's going to happen. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, recently came out and said that the reintroduction of capital controls could make sense under certain scenarios. I mean, Bitcoin helps bypass capital controls. Uh, anyone who's interested in financial freedom and, say, protecting their savings uh, should certainly be interested in Bitcoin, especially knowing the changing regulatory environment that we're in right now. In the same way they might be interested in gold. A absolutely. With, uh, you know, gold, though, has, you know, significant uh, costs associated with it. You've got to store it. You've got to protect it. It's difficult to move. So, so Bitcoin does away with a number of those. And, and you've seen gold prices relatively flat for quite a long time. They've come down even quite a bit. Um, you know, one possibility is the people who were looking at gold as a safe store of value have actually started to look at Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it also depends on the different types of people we're talking about. So Chamath X Facebook now runs social capital, big believer in Bitcoin, and his attitude was, in my opinion, anyone with significant wealth or wealth of a certain amount should be willing to put 1% of their net worth into Bitcoin. So, you know, you're worth 100 million and you put 100 or, you know, you put 1 million in, the risk to reward or reward to risk, put that on one side. The danger comes, and this is what I'm seeing more and more, is people who don't necessarily understand it and are jumping on it purely, not even understanding what Bitcoin is, going, hey, you know, 12 months ago today, it was 13 or 14 and it's gone up 70x or whatever. This is a quick and easy way to make money. Mm. And they don't have wealth put aside anyway, because you know, like most of the world, they're working people and they have a certain amount put aside. They're borrowing money on their credit cards or from their banks in this get rich quick scheme. That's where the worry for me comes. And as we know, it's usually those people who are left burnt at the end of anything significant like this. If you're understanding it, and if you're an entrepreneur or you're a risk taker, why wouldn't you do it? If you're speculating in gold or using it as a safety nest of uh, some kind, if you had put in, you know, a million dollars a year ago, that would be worth you know, close to 70 or 80 million dollars. And I think that's one of the things that yeah. really worries me going forward. So what are the risks? I mean, imagine a year from now, we're kind of talking, we're not talking about Bitcoin anymore because it died or it became irrelevant. What, what would cause that to happen? Anything at this point? Well, if you look at what happened in China, for example, they did not try to terminate Bitcoin, unlike what they did with QQ. And it's argued that one of the reasons they may have taken a more you know, nuanced regulatory stance is because they may not be able to kill Bitcoin uh, it's not centralized like QQ is. So there's some question about whether it really can go away given its uh, decentralized nature. Um, having said that, there's certainly a number of risks which uh, Bitcoin faces. You know, people are focused on the regulatory side of things. Uh, you know, I, as an economic historian, I, I, I can tell you that alternative currencies like Bitcoin are nothing new. They've been around for hundreds of years, if not longer. And by far and away, the more common cause of death uh, for alternative currencies is not regulation, although that does kill off a few. It's either technological advances or uh, insufficient demand. And if you look at Bitcoin, it already takes 10 minutes or more for the blockchain to update each, after each transaction. There's other cryptocurrencies that have come along since that update much more quickly. Uh, on the demand side of things, you know, James, you mentioned Litecoin. I mean, one of the interesting uh, angles to the Litecoin story is the fact that the founder decided not to retain uh, any of the Litecoins uh, once he created that currency. And, and that's given that, that currency a bit of a kind of an altruistic halo, if you will, effect. You could see people maybe looking at Bitcoin and saying, hmm, you know, this, this mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto character, who is he? He's a billionaire now. Uh, you know, maybe we want to make uh, Litecoin our preferred currency for some kind of social reason. Uh, so there are some risks out there that could disrupt Bitcoin. So social emotional dynamics come in much like they would for a product like iPhone or, mm. you know. 
something something that didn't take off. Yeah. Um, interesting. I mean, what is interesting is I have spoken on a number of these panels, and I did the Bitcoin panel last year, and asked the audience, you know, how many people had heard of Bitcoin. And there's probably 40% how many people had bought a Bitcoin, and it was less than 10%. And I was thinking outside, what we should really do is come out here and go, who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? Because Loic alone has talked about it enough, but you look at BBC, you look at CNN, everyone's been running enough news articles on it over the last few months that we've, there's, there's various tipping points that we're going to hit. Yeah. What is interesting in terms of the emotional element is, you know, there's a room here of very smart technologists and people who are normally at the forefront of technology. If we're sitting here educating them and educating us at the same, or educating ourselves at the same time, look at the gap between this and mainstream mm. adoption. So the emotional part, there's still a big, big divide of the education process and the news filtering down to what Bitcoin actually is. Right, and one of the things I've heard people say emotionally is, what's it backed by? It's just a digital thing in the nothing. It's in that internet thing. What's it backed by? So what is backing Bitcoin <laughs> and what backs normal currencies? Well, I mean, money is a rather abstract thing to begin with. I mean, it's, at least in the U.S., it's not taught how money even comes into existence. So if you ask people, where, what is money, it's, you get a kind of sometimes a perplexed look. And Bitcoin takes it a step further because there's no coin and notes. Um, but the important thing to know about any currency, uh, even national currencies, is that they're fundamentally backed by supply and demand. Uh, with, without you know, demand for them, there's, there's really uh, nothing there. Uh, you know, a government can, can force you to pay taxes in a currency, and that's argued as what backs, say, a fiat currency, uh, like the euro, like the dollar. Uh, but it's still subject to demand. I mean, Zimbabwe forced people to pay taxes in its currency, and it eventually, you know, that currency went away, and now the dollar has replaced it. Um, so, so these currencies that we, we use every day aren't so, so different than Bitcoin in terms of their fundamentals, I would say. Right, yeah. right. Um, so with any new technology, it usually has natural enemies and natural allies. Who, who are the natural allies? Who are the people who are going to try to bring Bitcoin and other math-based currencies to the world? And, and who, are, who are the people who are going to try to stop it? Who are the people who are threatened here? Well, if you look at governments to an extent, and I think we can, there's a, a number of different parties, but governments can be allies and they can be the enemies, um, purely from a lack of understanding. From an allied point of view, let's face it, the financial systems are broken. You know, there's no doubt about that. Some of the infrastructure being used is 10, 20, 30 years old. Um, it needs to move with the times. Right? And those banks are making a lot of money using that archaic system. Yeah. What were you telling me about London and clearing a check in London? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the costs involved there um, and at the same time, there's this opportunity, right? That, that this next generation, and I know this may seem very crazy, but if people are accepting that music and videos can be played over this thing called the cloud, and they're growing up not with a piggy bank where their grandmother gives them some cash and they put it in there, and it's money in their app store as such, this virtual destination where they can buy stuff from, and suddenly virtual currency isn't very uh, different. Do the governments want to embrace this? Absolutely. To me, I think it's just purely a lack of understanding, which is how it, it ends up being people in two different camps. That's one side of it. Then you've got the financial institution, who I think they suffer from the same thing. And um, I know me and Garrick talked about it earlier on, Garrick can share that, is the opportunities they see and also the risks and challenges because they're making so much money. Visa, for example, I think, you know, is watching this very, very closely. Right, mm -hmm. right. So any, any enemies, any, any people who we can expect to come and help this happen? Well, I think, you know, on the, on the friend side of things, I think consumers and businesses are, you know, form a powerful alliance. Uh, you know, any business that does a high volume, uh, low margin trade, you know, think of a grocer, think of, you know, someone operating in agriculture, uh, is looking at Bitcoin and saying, this can really help me save, say, 3% that I'm charged on my Visa and MasterCard transactions. Uh, you know, consumers, yeah, you know, certainly are interested in saving money, obviously. People, as we've talked about, looking to send money abroad. I mean, I, I know from when I was in Tanzania, 
sometimes it can take uh, you know, a transfer through three banks in several days to get funds into parts of Africa. Uh, you know, Bitcoin completely flattens that. Um, so there's, there's certainly some powerful allies, but I mean, I think the only certain en enemy, um, Shaq men mentioned governments could be both uh, friends and enemies, but the only certain enemies are, are probably the kind of the, the, the holders of the keys to the current payment system, the visas, the MasterCards, the Western unions. I think Bitcoin does threaten them, but uh, everyone else, I think, stands to gain quite a bit. Hmm. Okay. Is there, is there room for more than one currency, or is it a winner-take-all? Right now, we're seeing number two is one-tenth the size, and number three is one-tenth the size of number two. What, what? So, from a personal point of view, I have no idea, and I don't want to make any predictions where it ends up. What is obvious is that there is a need for something like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. you know, who knows? whether in two years' time or years' time, Bitcoin is even relevant, but some of the fundamental thinking that went behind it has been used for something new. I honestly don't know where it ends up. What I do know is if you look at Bitcoin versus every other coin out there, the demand, the awareness of it, and the transaction volume taking place, it seems like Bitcoin's the winner. But then if you go back to the web and look at Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator and some of those companies, you go back before that VHS and Betamax, this carries on, right? So you've got the Apple ecosystem, the Android ecosystem, who really knows? So I, I don't think there is a definitive answer to give on that. Like, and I'll come back to, I just know slightly more than the people in this room, and I'm sure there are people in this room who know far more about it. We're just in a, such a fascinating fast-moving space right now that making any predictions are going to be irrelevant in my opinion. Yeah. Is there any lesson from history we can take about multiple currencies or anything? Well, I mean, prior to the kind of explosion in, in cryptocurrencies we've seen recently, it was estimated there were some 4,000 alternative currencies around the globe. So certainly there's lots of room for, for alternative currencies out there and throughout history that's been the case. Having said that, I mean, I think part of the reason you've seen, uh, you know, Peter Thiel, Fred Wilson, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, Jim Breyer, and others really focus their investments on Bitcoin, or companies that can really focus on Bitcoin for now, is that this is a this is an uphill battle that Bitcoin's fighting. It's it's going to be a long, hard road potentially. As far as it's come already, it's it's still got a lot to go. And uh, you know, I, I think I think you need to see kind of a focus on a one currency uh, like we're seeing right now to kind of get this moving. Uh, into, uh, you know, a sustainable position. It's got the brand value. It's got the ecosystem. It's got the momentum. Critical Let's mass. Let's get behind a critical yep. mass. It's hard to do, right? It exactly. doesn't happen often. Yep. And, and so, so speaking of those venture guys, what, what companies are the most mm. interesting companies out there that you guys see? The ones mm. that have been backed or the ones that have not yet been backed? So I'm an investor in BitPay, so we have to leave that one to the side. Okay. Mm. Um, I think the most fascinating companies in the digital currency space are being built right now. I have no idea where they are, mm. but you know, if you look at the last 12 months, what has come out and what is required and the renewed interest from institutional investors, that they've missed the first wave and maybe there was a the right thing, maybe there was a the wrong thing. Um, these companies are being built and funded right now. I think Q1, Q2, we'll see a few of these starting to surface. Circle, which is backed by General Catalyst and Axel, and has got Jeremy Allaire, the founder of Bright Cove, behind it. Seems to be the first one of this batch. And this is the know, second generation. Yeah, of this is the second yeah. generation. Yeah. And what is also required, apart from the technology solution, is also the consumer trust and the branding effect. And I don't mean to discount that in any way, but you know, you're talking about somebody creating a wallet and expecting you or I to put in 10,000, 100,000 or 1,000, whatever is relevant, into something. You need some sort of consumer protection and consumer trust. And that comes with not just having lots of money backing it, but building a consumer brand and actually getting the trust off the end user there. The mm -hmm. things that have been happening this year, and there's, you know, you hear every day or every week that oh, so-and-so got hacked and so-and-so lost their coins. It wasn't the Bitcoin system or the protocol that was the problem here. It's basically somebody putting their money in a bank, which was run by somebody who had full intention of running away with their money. Yeah. Yeah. Any companies that you're seeing that, you know, because there's a bunch of exchanges. Most of the companies that have been backed by venture guys are, are, are exchanges slash wallets, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the companies that have been shut down are also exchanges. 
most of the companies shut down our exchanges, right? Well, I, I think we should plug Shaq's company, Coindesk, for just a second here. One of the big problems with, with Bitcoin and trying to study it is the data is not that great right now. Um, we don't know, say, for example, what the price of Bitcoin is. Uh, you know, in, is, it, is it the Chinese price? Is it the one at Gox? Is it uh, at another, uh, another exchange? So I, I really applaud what Coindesk is doing with their Bitcoin price index and trying to bring more transparency and visibility into some of these data questions. How many Bitcoins are being exchanged for, um, for merchant uh, transaction goods and services versus traded? Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions on the data side. So, you know, companies like Coindesk are doing, I think, good work in trying to, trying to help there. We, um, we got together before and, and just sort of as a, uh, we've got uh, 30 seconds left, just to give you a sense of some of the resources you all can go to if you're interested. Uh, the VCs that have stated explicitly they're looking at this are Ribbit Capital, Bit Angels, Lightspeed, Union Square, Y Combinator, and Boost Incubator. And then there's a bunch of supporting companies, companies that are supporting the ecosystem, starting with Coindesk. Um, and then there's a company called Ripple and Dwalla who are both intermediaries. Um, Silicon Valley Bank is developing expertise in this. Two law firms, Perkins Cooey and Paul Hastings, are very hot on this. And um, there's another group in San Francisco called Promontory that uh, is a real expert in this whole area. So these are some resources that you can go to if you're thinking of starting a company in this area. Um, so with five seconds left, should the people in this audience be investing in Bitcoin? I answered that earlier on, depends. <laughs> How much of your wealth you're willing to risk? Should somebody be leaving here and going, hey, I can make 100x on this and this is a quick way to make money? Absolutely not. Not. If you believe in the fundamentals of Bitcoin and digital currency and you're willing to take a certain risk, but first and foremost, expect that the downside is zero. You could lose every single dime. Everything. Accept that and move on. Come back to that. The biggest worry is people getting into Bitcoin not having any understanding what it is, but purely going, hey, my buddy John's programmer, geeky friend, made $4 million in the last 12 months, and I need to get into this. And that is starting to happen, and that will happen more and more. Got it. Thank you, guys. This has been Thank great. You. Appreciate Thank it. Great. Thanks, Thank James. You. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I have no Thank Bitcoin. You. I regret. I was told to buy them, uh, what, six months ago.